Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and today we're gonna keep talking about this very lazy uh, analogy to uh, rain and, and buckets and we looked last time at you know how um, if you have buckets that are fairly small, they could get full very easily, uh, so they could saturate and then they're not really relevant to measure anything anymore, which is exactly what happens with camera pixels when you expose for too long. We also saw that um, you could avoid that by taking multiple shorter exposures to the rain with your measuring apparatus. And if you had like a conveyor belt that, that was infinite and kept feeding you those buckets and you can expose and expose and expose and then you just add all the quantities of water that were measured for a given pixel and you do that for each of the pixels and you average that out or you just take the addition and you have a good measure of how much rain has fallen onto this area across those uh, 60 seconds um, or whatever exposure time you had chosen. So we saw like the, we, it's basically covering exactly the same ground as I had done in a previous video on the, uh, on the charts provided by a camera manufacturer, ZW in, uh, in my case. Now, let's also think a bit about the rain. Right now I've, talking about, I, I've been talking about only one type of rain and what was very interesting is to see that there is noise associated with the signal and that the more rain falls into my buckets, uh, the more in absolute terms, the more of a difference in the amount I collected between my buckets I see. Um, or between my exposures for the same buckets, I see like one time it will be one, one liter exactly, the second time it will be 1.03 liters exactly, uh, you know, one, the, second, the next time it will be 9.07 liters, etc, etc. But we've also seen that that um, uncertainty, while it increases in absolute terms, in relative terms to the signal, it decreases. So if I take the percentage of my uncertainty or my shot noise relative to the signal, it gets smaller and smaller, which is why taking longer, uh, having a total longer exposure time, it works great to uh, reduce the effect, the impact of that noise. Even though in actual terms, you are increasing the noise, it's just that the signal increases faster. Okay, so now, um, let's talk also a bit about heavy rain versus like a light drizzle rain. Uh, obviously we looked at the example where I exposed for one millisecond or I exposed for 60 seconds. Now let's imagine that uh, we are in a magical land where we have a perfect uh, border between an area of heavy rain on one side and an area of light drizzle on the other. And um, it reminds me of a, of a scene from The Truman Show, but that's unrelated. Anyway, um, so that means that, but I have the same bucket size, right? So what do I do? Because I want to expose long enough so that I can, you know, swamp my read noise, which is caused by the surface tension of my buckets. But at the same time, you know, uh, maybe my drizzle there, like the side that has the drizzle will not get enough water when I do the exposures to actually swamp that surface ten tension uh, caused noise. Um, but if I try to expose longer so that the drizzle side of things actually is able to swamp the, uh, the surface tension noise or the read noise for uh, a camera sensor, then maybe the, the, the pixels that are on the side of the heavy downpour of rain will already have filled up and saturated well darn, and that's where we, we get back to our concept of dynamic range uh, that I mentioned again in, in one of my previous videos. Um, because, okay, like I have to basically look at my image and I need to, in, to, to take into consideration the dimmest parts of my image and the brightest parts of my image and see how I can work with them together. Uh, and I need to consider the read noise, I need to consider the optimal exposure time, etc. And in a way, having light pollution helps for that because light pollution pro pro uh, provides a lot of light to the sensor. So I'm not, I'm flooding everything anyway, right? So I'm forced to take shorter exposures and hopefully, you know, my light pollution will not be so bad that uh, my, my exposure time determined by the light 
pollution would be lower than the optimal exposure time, in which case, you know, I'm trapped and there's nothing I can do about anything. So, yeah, we get an idea about like, you know, areas of, very, uh, of high brightness in the image, like the core of a galaxy, core of M31. And, and then when you get to the edges of the Andromeda galaxy, you start to see more and more noise in your image. Uh, the nebulosity, nebulosity is less and less clear. And yes, that's because you got, you got you know, uh, <laughs> less, you, you got to a light drizzle of the rain. And, you know, your read noise uh, came into, came to affect that more, etc, etc. So, <laughs> it's, it's how it kind of, uh, kind of works to take that analogy even further. Now, we can keep going with the, uh, the bucket analogy and I'm going to stretch it even further. We can, you know, imagine, imagine that when the cover is off, then magically there's a small jagged hole that appears at the bottom of each of my buckets and water very slowly leaks out of that hole. Well, you know, and the moment I, I close the cover, that hole closes as well. Okay, that's a pretty interesting magical hole, but, but whatever. So, okay, so I know that I'll be losing water. I'll be losing some of my signal. Um, and it's not perfect analogy at all, but okay, I'll be losing some of my signal in this scenario. And at the same time, um, I could average out, like I know that, that you know, I'm going to lose more signal the longer I expose, right? And at the same time, you know, I could actually say like, I know I'm going to expose for 60 seconds to the rain. So I am actually going to measure on average how much water is lost from that leak during the 60 seconds uh, exposures. And then I can, I can just add that back to my measurement in the end. And sure, that, that will work. So you take your bucket, you expose it, you, you expose it for, um, or let's say you, you pour a a known quantity of water in there exactly, you let the leak open for 60 seconds and then you measure how much is left. But then just like for the surface tension noise or the read noise, you're going to see that uh, if you do that several times in a row, you'll always find that the amount of water that escapes is slightly different each time. Um, and so I, oh no, and that uncertainty uh, over how much water left and so how much you have to add back to your bucket to restore the original value, well, that uncertainty, it grows as well with time. So like, huh, so now I have a source of, of noise that increases with the exposure time. Uh, interesting. And for your camera sensor, and I'm really stretching the analogy now, that would be the thermal noise. Uh, which is like the noise that accumulates from the heat of the sensor that adds electrons that should not be added to uh, your signal, to what you're trying to measure. And in the end, what you do is that for your given exposure time, well, you are going to uh, uh, take a dark frame. So if you exposed, if you used 60 seconds exposures, you're going to take dark frames of 60 seconds, which is closing the, the shutter by basically removing all signal. And, and you take many dark frames and you average that out because in my case, I want to take as many measurements of how much water leaks during the 60 seconds as possible because I want to have the very best estimate for this particular bucket. And I want to do the same each time. And so when I'm measuring that amount of water that leaks out and I want to take the average, then really my signal is the amount of water. What I want to measure is the amount of water that leaked out. And the noise is the variance between each take on the, the amount of water that is leaking out. And when I'm taking a, a dark frame, or in effect a bias frame for that matter, when we were re re like measuring the read noise, my signal, what I'm trying to measure, is that amount of water that is removed from the quantity that I'm trying to measure. Uh, 
And to make sure that I get that right average for each given pixel, I need to take many dark frames or many bias frames and average them out. That's why we want to take you know, as many bias frames as we can. Although I do not take bias frames for CMOS cameras, but I can go that into that into a later video or you know, take as many dark frames as we want, as we can to average out that offset that is created by my leak here in particular. Um, and you know, if you're doing flat frames, by the way, it's exactly the same thing. You want to take uh, flat darks or dark flats, whichever your term terminology is, and you want to take as many as possible to take the average value to know what your offset is. But again, you're just measuring an average value. So you'll be able to correct for the slightly different offset for each pixel. And that lets you correct for the fixed pattern noise in your camera. So there's the fixed pattern that is, that is caused by the read noise, which on average is slightly different per pixel. There's the fixed pattern caused by the thermal noise, which is on average slightly different per pixel. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna get rid of that average by using bias frames, by using dark frames, and by using dithering. So that's what all of this does. It does not remove the random element of that noise. The uncertainty about how much uh, water has actually leaked from my bucket each time or how much water has actually stayed in the bucket when I tried to measure how much was inside by pouring it into a larger bucket. Um, so, you know, your calibration frames are very important, but the uncertainty linked to the thermal noise and to the read noise is still there. It doesn't correct for that. So something to uh, keep in mind there. Now, one of the things with our, my leak there is that we've seen that, it, that the uncertainty increases with exposure time. So because the uncertainty increases with exposure time, I cannot reduce it or overwhelm it by exposing, exposing longer, unlike the read noise, right? So that uncertainty does not change my minimum exposure time that I need to uh, overwhelm the noise. And it so happens that in effect, uh, the signal will grow faster than the thermal noise uh, does over you know, um, a series of long exposures or over your total exposure time. So that again, by taking, you know, more exposure time, even though in absolute terms, you are increasing your thermal noise, you're not uh, increase, you're not decreasing your signal to noise ratio, you're actually getting a better signal to noise ratio. So in relative terms, relative to your signal, the amount of uncertainty diminishes. And so that's why thermal noise doesn't really need to be considered when you look at minimum exposure times or optimal exposure times. The read noise needs to be considered in that case because the read noise uh, does, not de does not depend on the, um, the length of your exposures. And plus it happens every single time you measure that darn pixel. Okay, so uh, that's one thing. So one other thing I'm gonna touch about, upon as well in this video is uh, the uh, amp glow. So if you have uh, a 183 or 294 camera from ZW, you'll have noticed that you have beautiful amp glow in your camera. So if you take dark frames, you'll see like maybe a star-shaped pattern coming from the right of your sensor. And um, you know, that's again, that, uh, that pattern there, uh, well, it's, it's a signal and the signal is something that you can measure. You can measure the average of that signal and you can uh, remove it from your light frames to correct for that uh, amp glow. Sure, but you've measured the average and you've removed the average, but that signal, that amp glow also has an uncertainty. Sometimes it's slightly higher for one pixel, sometimes it's slightly lower for one pixel. And so that M-Glow actually injects noise in the area of M-Glow. That's something to remember. Uh, your dark frames will get rid of the visible M-Glow, but you'll still have a worse signal to noise ratio in that area. And this is compounded by the fact that this amp glow actually prefills your bucket with a certain amount of water or a certain amount of electrons. And so where the amp glow is appearing, you have less dynamic range available. So something to keep in mind. And this is why, you know, getting rid of amp glow or buying a camera that has no amp glow is 
not just about like not having to calibrate with darks or making your workflow easier it's also about signal to noise ratio in the area of the amp glow so yeah uh, you know amp glow people will tell you like it goes away with dark frame cal calibration which is true but the noise that has been added by that amp glow the uncertainty there is still there so just keep that in mind. And uh, I think that's pretty much it uh, for this video. I hope that was, uh, that was useful again. Again, I'm really starting to stretch the analogy, uh, but next time we're gonna stretch the uh, analogy probably even a bit more. It's probably going to be a much shorter video, but we're gonna look at uh, light pollution. But I think you've started to see that Everything is about the uncertainty related to various signals. Some of them are wanted, some of them are unwanted. So with that, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like. Please also subscribe so you don't miss uh, the, the next episode in that series. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't forget to look up at the stars and see you next time.